Okay. So numbers are settling. Um, so I'll begin. Um, and as I said before, my name is Harriet O'Neill um, and I'm Assistant Director for the Humanities and Social Sciences at the BSR. For those of you who are new to us, uh, we generally hold lectures or seminars on a Wednesday night in Rome and the virtual uh, lectures are part of moving this important aspect of our work online. We have one more lecture after this one, so do listen in. But don't worry, we're not going to abandon you over the summer. We've arranged um, a programme of 10 minute talks to take place in July and September. And we'll also be looking back at our archive of um, lectures and we'll be drawing from all aspects of the BSR's work. So do uh, either sign up to our mailing list or follow us on Twitter for all more information about those events. So tonight um, we're delighted uh, to have a lecture from our director who has been our director since 2017, Professor Stephen Milner. Uh, Stephen, uh, Stephen uh, obtained his degree and MA from the University of Cambridge and the PhD from the Warburg Institute, which is part of the University of London. He has lectured at the University of Cambridge and the University of Bristol and served as the Serena Professor of Italian, Chair of Italian Studies and Head of Department at the University of Manchester. He is also uh, a member of the Executive Committees for the Society of Italian Studies and the Dante Alighieri so uh, Society in Manchester and is member of the AHRC Peer Review College. He has been Honorary Secretary of the Society for Renaissance Studies, which is a, a body that we will continue to work very closely with, with great pleasure. Um, his publications are, are wide, but um, may, may, the ones I'd like to draw attention to are in the field of Italian late medieval and Renaissance studies and include books on Boccaccio and Machiavelli, amongst others. He's held uh, research fellowships at Harvard, at the University for Italian Renaissance Studies, at Villa Tati in Florence and the House and Library at Harvard, and of, also at the BSR, where he has also served as a member of FAL, which is um, our Faculty for Archaeology, History and Letters, and that was from 2007 to 2013. So it just leaves me uh, to say that I'm going to disappear now and I'll reappear at the end of the conversation to uh, field the questions to Stephen and to remind you that this event is being recorded. So over to you, Stephen, with three degrees of separation, community, culture and contagion in pre-modern Italy. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you very much, Harriet. I'm now going to move over to shared screen uh, with everybody so we can begin. Okay. Thank you very much indeed. Um, okay, it's uh, lovely to be here. I'm speaking from the BSR itself. So although we're uh, still closed on account of the pandemic, which will be a part of the subject of tonight's lecture, um, I'm still in situ uh, holding the fort. So uh, the title of my uh, presentation this evening uh, comes out of the fact that um, recent circumstances uh, and increased engagement with contemporary uh, proclamations and decrees as serially issued over the last four months or so by the Italian government uh, set me to reflect upon some aspects of the historical uh, research that I've been doing over the past years and not exactly try and fuse everything into a, a, a single perspective, but at least bring to bear some of the thought processes and some of the uh, ideas that I've been having around issues to do with community, issues to do with um, late medieval and Renaissance um, civic life, um, space, uh, architecture, um, and bodily motility. So uh, one of the things that I've been working on recently uh, are, is the figure of the town crier, uh, in Florence um, and amongst the proclamations as we'll see um, that were made by the town cry were a number that concerned um, social distancing uh, and issues to do with the way in which the community confronts uh, and seeks to overcome the problems caused by plague, by, by contagion. So I wanted to use that as a point of departure for having a reflection on some of the things which have been happening more recently on the experiences that we've all been involved in uh, in terms of lockdown, in terms of limitations on our ability to move freely around the spaces, the cities um, and between the countries that we're used to migrating between and moving between. Uh, and also the psychological dimension of, of lockdown um, and the ways it brought us closer together with some people, um, but 
forced us apart from other people um, that we were normally used to seeing on a regular basis. So it was a, the kind of stimulus in a sense of the contemporary events and what's happening, but using that to look back into aspects of research that I've historically done uh, in the past to just reflect um, on what might be, uh, to some extent, the new order or the new shape of things when we come out of the other side of this um, and uh, to reflect on the place of culture, um, particularly uh, within these new dynamics uh, that have emerged most recently. So I want to start by uh, just showing you uh, a slide which I'm sure you've all seen, uh, which is uh, dramatic in its uh, obvious uh, statistical uh, reach. Um, and that's this, this diagram of, of, of relative death tolls from major pandemics uh, through history. And we can see there um, uh, in the most obvious dark purple blob, the over 200 million people um, who were killed by the, the Black Death in the mid 14th century. And if we look right down to the bottom, and I think now uh, we have to move on because the coronavirus, the COVID-19 has actually overtaken um, Ebola and potentially also in numbers, uh, yellow fever. But just to give us some idea of the, in a sense, regularity to a degree of pandemics um, within uh, history, um, and the extent to which I think they've, they've impacted uh, on um, literary production, actually, on, on, on ways in which people have sought to confront it uh, within literary forms uh, and within narrative. So uh, the extent of the, the, the Black Death in Europe is hard. It's just hard to imagine. I mean, 30 to 60 percent of Europe's population uh, wiped out somewhere between 75 uh, and 200 million people in total. And absolutely hard to imagine devastating impact um, upon communities um, uh, across across Europe and to a certain extent that kind of shock that trauma of mass loss and the anonymity in a sense and yet the the, the specificity of the emotional experience of loss in terms of it, people's individual lives, I found very powerfully represented in the pages of the newspapers, especially in Brescia and Bergamo, that were very much at the heart of the pandemic when it broke out in Lombardy, um, in Northern Italy, uh, towards the end of February. And uh, the publication of these uh, sort of mini obituaries with the thumbnail, some thumbnail images that just took over uh, those newspapers brought home to me in a sense the enormity of the reality that behind each of these little notifications behind each of these thumbnails stood a whole story of a, of a family of close ones of people who've been separated people who are unable to be alongside those that they loved uh, as they died and brought home in a very visual visceral sense um, the kind of enormity that it's difficult to imagine from just looking um, at a, a diagram uh, like the one I've just shown you previously here. So with the, the Black Death came a, a degree of black humor uh, as well. Uh, I saw this particular fake tapestry um, doing the rounds uh, on social media during the period of the Black Death where we've got the, uh, the pipistrella from China there, which is seen as the, the kind of source of, of the coronavirus in some accounts. Um, and this kind of Bayer tapestry uh, mock-up with people distancing by one meter, um, people wearing masks, uh, the ban on assemblies, um, people seeking to isolate themselves. Um, and it's, it's been noticeable how even within uh, the, the kind of calamity, which has been the COVID-19, the ways in which people reacted kind of culturally, uh, but also through these kind of ironic observations, is, is referencing and seeking um, to reference the past and the experiences of the past when confronting similar situations. Um, in Florence itself, which is going to be predominantly the focus of the first half of, the, uh, of my paper this evening, um, in third, there were three plagues within very short space of time of each other that had increasingly devastating impacts upon the population. So we had in 1340, according to the chronicler Giovanni Villani, um, there were some 15,000 who died in 1340, another 4,000 uh, in 1347, um, but the majority or the biggest impact was had with the, the, the Black Death itself in 1348, plague in Florence, which killed between 50 and, and 80,000 uh, members of the population of the city, which for a city in the middle of the, uh, of the 14th century 
was a, a huge amount. Now, how do you react to this, or how do people seek to react to this uh, existential uh, threat in terms of their, their mental well-being? There was a lovely piece relatively recently on the 12th of June by a, a, a dear friend of the British School at Rome, um, Catherine Edwards and a former colleague from Bristol in the Evening Standard. And um, Catherine's great specialism is the, the classics and especially uh, stoicism. And uh, she wrote a, a piece that noted the Renaissance, in a sense, or the increase of interest in stoicism as a philosophy and proposed it in some ways as a means of actually an answer to lockdown uh, anxiety, noting that there had been a 350% increase um, in the book sales um, of the uh, um, uh, Marcus Aurelius and works by other Stoics, in called, uh, including the, the letters, of, uh, letters of Seneca. Um, personally, in terms of Stoicism, I find it difficult to buy into the notion that one can somehow distance one's physical environment from one's mental well-being. But I think that was the fundamental premise of Stoicism as a philosophy um, seeking to bring about kind of happiness, is that one was able to separate through meditation and through contemplation one's mental state from one's physical state. And yet it seems to me that during the current pandemic and in other iterations or engagements in culture uh, with pandemics, um, other writers have not necessarily gone to stoicism uh, as a way of thinking about how to confront the issues that confront them, um, but have thought to think about it through other philosophical schools. But it's interesting that stoicism in particular uh, seems to be with its, its differentiation, its separation of the mental world, the kind of cognitive distancing from the spatial and from the effective, um, uh, a particular philosophical school um, that people have actually uh, sought to turn to. Now, obviously, uh, Stoicism uh, um, uh, also depends upon, as I said, that abjection of the, of the actual physical space within, what, within which one is uh, situated. And one of the great narratives of the uh, books of consolation uh, in the medieval period was obviously Boethius's The Consolation of Philosophy, where, which is written out, for, out of a prison experience. So, again, a kind of a, an enforced lockdown um, and the popularity certainly of Boethius uh, during the Middle Ages in, in Florence, in Tuscany and across the Italian peninsula is testified by the numerous translations into the vernacular uh, that took place over the course of the, especially of the, of the Trecento. And it's interesting that we have here, we have the, the beautiful caricature of Leonardo of the Tre Corone of the uh, Italian literary canon of, of Dante, um, Petrarch, and then finally uh, Boccaccio. That all three of them within their works, sort of poetic and philosophical and narrative, deal with issues of space, of distance and of, of social lives. Obviously, in the case of Dante, who wrote what Pat Boyd always refers to as the greatest ghost story in history, uh, we have a, a portrait of social life after death. Um, Petrarch's philosophical works were overtly stoic in terms of how one confronts and overcomes uh, the tests and the tribulations that are thrown our way by adverse fortune. Uh, and with Boccaccio, obviously one of the most famous um, uh, texts, as we will see, uh, that discovers and, and discusses, sorry, um, plague, uh, which was the, the Decameron. So all of these texts and all of these writers within this particular context are interested in, in, in the interrelation between space, on the one hand, between desire, and emotion uh, on the other, and the limitations and the problematics uh, that come through forms of enclosure. And there's a marvelous uh, volume called Claustrophilia within the New Middle Ages series, which precisely looks at these, uh, the, 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 the narratives and the way in which emotion and desire and love can be mediated um, through restriction, through spaces and through lockdowns. And those were some of the issues as well that was, were looked at in the uh, co-edited volume uh, in the same series that I did with Catherine Leglue, The Erotics of Consolation, where again we were looking at the way in which culture, uh, uh, writings, letters uh, sought to foreclose, in a sense, uh, the distances between people um, through uh, literary form. 
So Boccaccio's Decameron, much like um, Catherine's kind of stoic writers, has also undergone something of a, a, um, a boom in terms of sales. Uh, as we can see here, he's experienced a 288% uplift um, since the, uh, up until the 23rd of, uh, of April, um, so just a kind of um, uh, two months ago. Um, precisely because I think it addresses some of these issues uh, to do with the play, but also to do with both consolation, but also entertainment. Um, and uh, hopefully that's something that will uh, come out um, uh, in the talk when we get to talk specifically about uh, Boccaccio's to Cameron. I'm showing you here on the right the, the famous autograph um, of Boccaccio's to Cameron that's held, uh, held in Berlin. But where I want to start is, is looking at uh, the, the figure of the town crier. Um, and the research that um, I, I did when I, when I was in Florence, specifically about these plague uh, proclamations. Um, one consequence of doing this research was an invitation to Chester uh, back in 2014 uh, to attend the World Town Crier Championships. And I didn't realise that there was a town crier journal as well called The Crier, uh, which you can, you can see there. Um, but one of the reasons I was invited was because of a study that I'd done um, around that time, looking specifically at the town crier and the figure of the town crier uh, within Florence. Um, and uh, here we can see on the um, uh, left hand side of the screen, um, one of the a little depiction in the margins of a, a Florentine provision um, of the Quattrocento, uh, which concerns the actual appointment uh, of the town criers by the, the city council. So I was lucky enough to be pointed in the direction of, of three rather large filze um, uh, that spanned the period between about 1470 and 1520 by um, Alison Brown from uh, Royal Holloway. Um, and these filze were from a magistracy, magistracy called the Otto di Guardia, who were basically the, uh, the equivalent of the kind of police force um, of Renaissance Florence. And within these three fields here that came right at the end of the archival series of documentation uh, in the archive, uh, were contained original copies of a whole series of proclamations that were read out by the city's um, town criers. And it's clear when we actually look at the documents themselves and the, the yellow image that I've given you uh, to the upper right of the screen, we can actually see the two holes where these pieces of paper, which had to be signed off by the town crier to admit uh, and, um, and uh, yeah, testify to the fact that they've been delivered, were actually either placed on, on spikes or probably onto a, uh, a thin string, which obviously is the, is the fila, as they say in Italian, um, from which etymologically we get the sense of, of, of filing. Um, to be put, put on a feeler. Um, so these volumes contained uh, a multitude, over, over 750 uh, proclamations that were specifically uh, issued by the town criers um, of the city. And here I'm just giving you some images of the documents themselves to see how they were actually like small letters that were folded over uh, and kind of kept in the, in the pocket. Um, they'd have written on them uh, what the subject of the proclamation actually was and dated. Sometimes on the back they'd have a list of places, here you can see uh, on the right hand side, a list of places where a specific proclamation uh, was, uh, was to be read out. Um, and what I managed to do uh, as part of my research was to kind of map the spaces within the city from a combination of the information contained on the proclamations themselves, but also the information that was contained within statutes um, uh, which regulated the issuing of these kind of public information announcements and map it onto the, the, the cityscape of, of, of Renaissance Florence. And we can see how it's, it touches the key points in terms of bridges, major uh, churches and civic buildings, entrances and doors, um, and gave us some idea of the way in which the information economy of Renaissance Florence was actually managed uh, in terms of people being issued uh, with news, with information, or asked for information uh, as part of the town crier's function. So back in 2013, um, by pure happenstance, I happened to be um, uh, in Florence at that period, and it was the, the anniversary, uh, the 500th anniversary of the um, first, well, the first stesura, the first um, uh, attempt, sort of text, draft of Machiavelli's prints. 
And because within the, the filter that I discovered, we found uh, the uh, original proclamation that was read out calling for his capture, uh, we were fortunate enough to get the backing of the local mayor in Florence to do a historical reconstruction, um, taking actually the guy on the horse is one of the Florentine vigili, so it's one of the uh, traffic wardens of Florence who volunteered to dress up um, and use his horse uh, to go round the city, including into the Piazza della Signoria that you see here, and issue the proclamation literally on the day, the 500th anniversary, uh, that the proclamation went out for the capture of Machiavelli before his um, uh, exile um, and the writing of the prince itself. So the catalyst for the production of that text. But within that collection, there were a, a whole host of um, other proclamations spanning over uh, the Republican period uh, up until the 1520s. Now, Aspects of these proclamations can still be found within the uh, city itself. And here I've given you one particular lapide or stone in tablature, which has been inserted into a wall uh, against the playing of ball games within a particular piazza. So there are still almost concrete uh, witnesses uh, to this process. But fundamentally, during the period that we're looking at, they were given on, they weren't given or embedded into walls, but they were actually uh, written on pieces of paper a read out by the town crier who would be on horseback uh, and had his trumpet and went round some 40 different locations in the city reading out his proclamations and here are just as uh, two instances two documents which are within uh, the filter that i was actually looking at um which have been actually bound in uh, as individual um, documents and a number of these and this is where I, what i specifically wanted to look at uh, were related to um, uh, the play. So there were proclamations about the expectations and the requirements in terms of the regulation uh, of the plague. And we can see here one from the 29th of May 1504, um, where they're actually requiring that anybody who was coming da Siena or suo contado or da Roma e di qualunque altro luogo ammorbato, so anybody else who's coming from areas which have been affected by the plague, are basically banned from entering the city. The city is kind of put in a, an effective uh, quarantine um, and anybody transgressing uh, is told that they will receive um, uh, 10 whips um, and also be subject to a, 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 a financial penalty um, of two florins. There's also a ban on people actually hosting them. So, I mean, I, there was a reciprocal uh, expectation in a sense when these bans were issued these proclamations were issued that not only were people not to be coming in but also the citizens had a certain responsibility in a kind of neighborhood watch function uh, of making sure that people were not hosting or putting up people who come from outside who could potentially um, uh, infect uh, the wider community and here we have um, uh, um, another one which is actually ben banning the entrance into Florence again in 1504 so the early part of the 16th century um, any prostitutes actually coming into Florence from Rome Siena uh, and Genoa um, and there the fine was uh, 50 uh, um, Florentine um, Florins uh, Larghi um, and non se ne ricevera scusa alcuna. There'll be no exceptions will be made for, for, for anybody uh, in this particular instance. So interesting to see that there are particular uh, constituencies or social groups that are being targeted um, at moments of, of anxiety about plague infection uh, through the media, medium of these particular pr uh, proclamations. Um, in, earlier in 1479, um, there's this uh, lovely section and, and periodically these the, the, the actual texts of these proclamations when it came to um, plague notifications were fairly standard so we'll find them repeated it's almost as if they've got a template that they use when there is the threat of a plague um, and they roll out on a regular basis and this one's i think is a fairly typical example um, of the type um, so we've got here that uh, anybody who's actually praticasse con quelli siano tenuti e debbano portare un segno evidente, cioè una banda bianca e cucita addosso al braccio manco. So people who were coming into contact with people who were, were, were contagious 
um, people who were coming in, who actually had the plague themselves were required to actually wear a sign. So it's almost a kind of um, uh, a kind of contact tracking, so that people could actually avoid them. It's a bit like the leper's bell to some extent. Um, and similarly, it says so priests, monks who are taking confessions of people who've got the plague, um, doctors, um, barbers, and hairdressers. Um, and I, there were some interesting uh, interventions by uh, local mayors in, in Italy uh, about people who were uh, insistent on going for their haircuts uh, in the recent months and the dangers came with that. But even back in the um, 1470s, there was this anxiety about um, the hairdressers or the barber's shop as a place of encounter of coming together. And also grave diggers and other pe anybody who was actually administering or looking after uh, people who had the plague were required to carry this particular sign, including women and children. It says, e le donne e fanciulle devono portare a volta e cucito intorno al braccio manco evidente un nastro bianco. So in such a way that quelli che non sono ammorbati e non conservano con quelli possono facilmente evitare tale contagio. So easily avoid the contagion that might come with too close a contact. So very, not, not massively dissimilar to the kind of uh, provisions and, and, and proclamations and requests that we're um, on the end of uh, at the current time. Now, there's this particular uh, proclamation from slightly earlier in 1478. It's interesting because it relates to uh, the governance of, of hospitals and the regulation of plague victims as they move uh, through the hospitals. So the, hosp the main hospital in Florence was Santa Maria Novella, um, and uh, they actually offered services uh, and people who were plague victims could actually go to the hospital and would be taken care of um, within the hospital complex itself. So uh, it does also, as they says, they will be governati diligentamente, so a duty of care in terms of the quality of the care that they were to receive. Um, and that those people who wanted to, on the other hand, self-isolate and remain at home um, and didn't want to actually uh, leave the, the house, um, they could actually have doctors come and, and see them. But again, with this uh, continual requirement uh, that somebody's uh, where anybody infected or in contact with infected pe people is wearing this banda bianca. Um, the other thing that they, they mention in this particular uh, provision um, uh, is the, the idea that the, the, the doctors themselves um, uh, um, should wear this sign, um, but also uh, in the final uh, section that a, a, a particular area of the hospital is actually going to be put aside for the patrician elite. So we have uh, a più an ordinato una stanza in detto ospedale di Santa Maria Nuova, separata dalle altre, che se alcuno uomo da bene a basse e vole, volesse ire a detto ospedale, starà separato dalle altre malati. So there's a, a, a kind of a special facility that's actually put to one side um, to look after the patrician elite, should any of them fall ill and require uh, hospital treatment within the city's uh, main hospital complex. Similarly, we have the same kind of provisions being made against other areas of social aggregation, specifically marketplaces. And we can see here um, an, uh, a provision that re relates to the plague, but touches on the practices of, of butchers and, and people selling meat, um, where obviously there was a, a tradition of uh, inflating uh, the bodies of the uh, the dead animals um, uh, uh, and that this was actually the band there was some notion uh, obviously of, of transmission could happen between animals and between humans which is interesting in the context uh, of the of, of the current pandemic as well um, so the ban here was uh, on that anybody who's gonfiare alcuna bestia con bocca come se cosueto um, with the advice that ma debino dette bestie gonfiare con mantici. So instead of doing it by mouth, uh, they should use a pair of uh, a bellows uh, in order to uh, inflate or introduce air into the, uh, the body of the animal for sale. Now, quite why they would do that, I'm sure somebody will let me know. Uh, I know it is a practice which is actually banned in many markets across the world because it actually increases the weight of the animal uh, and therefore the, the, the on-sale uh, cost. Um, uh, okay, so markets were, a, were another error. And here I've given you an image of the market at San Lorenzo, and we can see this proclamation from 1482, uh, which is specifically 
um, uh, preventing people from coming and frequenting and bringing merchandise of any sort into the Piazza di San Lorenzo, uh, all the surrounding area. And we can see the uh, on the image there, the temporary stalls that have been put up that those of us who've been to Florence uh, know only too well. Uh, and the whole of the, the surrounding area. Because markets were perceived as being, again, sites of specific social aggregation where people would come together and where there was a risk of that contamination uh, and uh, a risk of, of, of passing on um, uh, the plague. In addition, the second half of this particular provision from 1482, che nessuna persona addisca o presuma come di sopra fare o fa fare alcuna representazione. I take that to be a kind of a sacral re representation, a, a religious dramatic um, uh, performance, any festa, party, or ballo, or any other gathering, altra radunantia, tanto nelle città di Firenze quanto fuori di quelle in alcun modo. So again, a ban on people coming together in groups, whether they be for, for the theatrical, street theatrical uh, activity, uh, for parties, for dances, or any other form of, of social aggregation. So incredibly similar to the kind of prescriptive um, um, edicts and requirements that we've been um, uh, subject to ourselves. And here I just wanted to give you this uh, a little quote um, that, that, that talks about this cross-species infection, uh, the realization that foodstuffs um, and animals, and this is something that Boccaccio picks up uh, in the in the introduction to the Decameron, uh, can also be transmitters in terms of contagion. So cross-species infection uh, can originate on farms or markets where conditions foster mixing of pathogens, giving them opportunities to swap genes and gear up to infect and sometimes kill previously foreign hosts. So this, it's almost as if there's a, a recognition um, within medieval Renaissance practice that um, uh, markets and places where people come together and also people with, mixed with animals uh, are also areas of particular concern where particular attention needs to be paid. So the, the, the notion of disease carrying parasites are not picky about their hosts and that human disease themselves can decimate animal populations and vice versa shows the kind of the contagion going um, in both directions. So moving on to Boccaccio himself, and here I've given you an image just of the, of the um, Comune of Certaldo, uh, where Boccaccio was born, um, uh, in order to situate him just, just outside Florence. But I mean, Boccaccio is interesting in terms of uh, being cited on a regular basis as somebody who bore testimony to the uh, plague and the Black Death in 1348. And we can see here, and I've given you the image of this particular document from the archives in Florence, that Boccaccio was actually in 1348, he was elected uh, as one of the gabalieri of one of the customs officials uh, of, of the commune who would have been overseeing the coming and going of goods into the city uh, during the period of the lockdown. Um, so this specific uh, attention, if you like, which I think this evidence is, and it's a relatively recent archival discovery of this document, uh, gives sense in it to some of the witnesses and what's written in the introduction um, to the Decameron itself, where Boccaccio writes, if it had not been so often witnessed and I had not seen it in my own eyes, I could have scarcely believed it, let alone write about it. And that's Boccaccio obviously in the voice of the, the main narrator of the Decameron itself. But it's telling to, to see, and here we have it in detail, we can see Dominus Gabalieris, so the, the, the masters of the, of the customs, Johannes Boccacci de Certaldo uh, listed there as one of the two representatives for the four month office uh, from the quarter of uh, Santo Spirito uh, on the Ultra Arno, um, where Boccaccio uh, lived. So the thing that struck me about rereading the, the Proemio and the introduction to Boccaccio's Decameron was the stark parallels, again, going back to the newspapers from Brescia and Bergamo that I showed you at the, at the outset, of the, some of the, the comments that he made in light of uh, the images that we've seen um, of late uh, coming through on the in newspapers um, and on the television. And these are quotes, uh, quotes from the, the, the English translation from uh, Boccaccio's to Cameron. No medical advice or medicines seemed to be effective against this disease. The city was full of corpses. Um, and what made this pestilence worse was that the healthy could catch it from the sick merely by being in contact with them. Just as fire was spread to dry and oily objects when they are too close, merely touching the clothes or anything else which the sick had touched or used seemed to transfer uh, the infection. 
So again, here, this, this uh, concern on the part of the, the narrator within the introduction uh, and the proemia to Boccaccio's to Cameron around means of transmission um, and how to actually uh, contain but also track those kind of contacts, which are precisely the things which we're, we're struggling with and seem to be struggling with more in the UK uh, than maybe in Germany or, or in Italy. Uh, but this contact tracing. And I found very impactful the, the images that came over from New York. Um, and again, it reminded me of the, the section in, in Boccaccio's introduction, where he writes, not only were people dying without a group of women around them, the traditional mourners, but many passed away without any witnesses at all. Priests, with the help of the so-called grave diggers, and without taking the trouble to say a long or solemn, or solemn office, put the body as quickly as they could into any unoccupied grave. So when all the graves were occupied, very deep pits were dug in the churchyards into which the new arrivals were put in their hundreds. And as they were stowed there, one on top of the other, like merchandise in the hole of a ship, each layer was covered with a little earth until the pit was full. Now, in terms of the origins of the plague, another parallel that kind of struck me was is the... the uh, um, conspiracy theory about it coming out of a, a lab in China. But it's, it's uh, again, the, the, the chiming, uh, the redolent chiming with Boccaccio's observations at the beginning of the introduction, where he says, this plague, whether it came through the operation of the heavenly bodies or was visited upon the human race by God's righteous anger as a punishment for our sins, originated some years before in the East. After claiming innumerable, innumerable lives, it did not remain in one place, but spread disastrously uh, to the West, which is precisely um, the uh, trajectory, in a sense, that we've um, seen happen over the course uh, of the last six, seven months. And one of the things that's also struck me in terms of uh, what Boccaccio has to, says in the has to say in the introduction is the difference in the way in which particular groups of people within society have reacted to the reality uh, of the lockdown. And I'm, a couple of weekends ago, I noted in the news in the UK uh, about two raves that took place um, uh, in Manchester uh, over that weekend, uh, one in Failsworth uh, and the other um, uh, in South Manchester. And it, it, it was interesting reading the, the BBC webpage, uh, why I want to go to lockdown raves, when you actually look to see what uh, Boccaccio was saying in terms of human behaviour um, in the middle part of the 14th century. He says, others drawn into a contrary opinion declared that heavy drinking, pleasure seeking and going around singing and enjoying themselves, gratifying every urge and making mock of what was going on was the best medicine for such a serious disease. So a more Epicurean rather than Stoic uh, reaction to the phenomenon that they're confronting them. Um, and he adds, others had a more heartless opinion or, although one that was also perhaps more accurate, saying that there was no better safeguard from the pestilence than to flee before it, caring for nothing but their own skins. Many men and women abandoned their city. And I think in the UK, there is a famous case of somebody running to abandon their city. Um, so these observations on the part of Petrarch and these observations as mediated through the proclamations that I've shown you from Florence set me thinking about the ways in which Florentine historiography has actually talked about society, has talked about, um, sought to analyse the dynamics of social interaction uh, and of coming together in order to understand the kind of the everyday, if you like, of Florentine social practice. And I thought it's particularly interesting to contemplate or think around some of these things in relation to the issues that have been raised um, already in this talk, specifically in relation to notions of contact, um, notions of touch uh, specifically, um, and notions of, of, of kind of contagion in terms of forms of civic behavior. And one of the uh, most suggestive or provocative, in a way, portraits of Florentine social relations is produced by a, a social anthropologist, an historical anthropologist called Ronald Weissman, uh, who's written a book on ritual, ritual brotherhood about the confraternities um, in Florence in the, in the 15th century. And Weissman uh, has coined the phrase, the importance of being ambiguous in terms of social relations. Um, so the important importance of, of what we probably in anthropological terms call face work. 
Um, and it's not surprising that his, his observations and his methodology um, draws out of the kind of Chicago school of symbolic interactionists. But he gives us actually quite a dark portrait of social relations in Florence, because he talks about th this figure of Judas the Florentine, that as a mercantile society that was fixated with contract and the marketplace and reciprocity, that actually a Florentine would sell his best friend if the price was right. So that in terms of loyalty um, and in terms of uh, trustworthiness, uh, Florentines were ready to name the price on anything within this sort of rather negative, uh, very pessimistic, dark vision uh, of social relations, uh, which he characterized by Judas. Now, obviously, in terms of contact, the, the act, very act of betrayal of Judas um, to Christ uh, was the kiss. So there, the, 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 the kind of, uh, and I think that uh, um, accounts for the, uh, the quote from the um, famous uh, uh, 15th century Bishop of Florence, Antoninus, uh, who was Archbishop of Florence um, in the first half of the um, uh, 15th century. And that quote at the beginning of uh, Weissman's uh, chapter, first chapter of his book on ritual brotherhood, uh, the, f the flatterer is truly the worst of traitors. While he charms and makes pr protestations of his love, he kills the soul. He is vicious in his caresses, and so he is like Judas, who betrayed Christ uh, with a kiss. Now, these issues about community cohesion, um, sense of belonging, uh, obligation to others within a community, are uh, run right the way through the kind of history of sociology and the history of writings on community. And I've just put you an image there of a, a relatively recent book by Richard Sennett on the rituals, pleasures and politics of kind of cooperation. But I think in this time at the moment, questions of kind of cooperation, questions of, uh, of, of, of empathy, um, have been really thrown into the fore by the kind of limitations, some of the contrasts and the tensions between, on the one hand, the diktats of, 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 of governments and those responsible for seeking to mitigate the risks of contagion through contact. But then how does one prioritise that relative to, say, for example, most recently, um, the, the, the reanimation uh, on a massive scale uh, um, of the Black Lives Matters movement in terms of descending into the streets and into the public places of the city uh, to make a point and to register and to, and to kind of articulate and to protest. So these, these contrary tensions, uh, if you like, um, that we find ourselves confronted with um, at the moment. And I find that a vision of, uh, of Judas the Florentine deeply pessimistic and, and, and rather disturbing and also quite kind of reactionary in the sense that it, it implicates the notion that an individual is always waiting to see what somebody is going to do before they're actually going to react in order to seeking maximum profit uh, from that action. And what I propose, and again, it comes back to a, another issue to do with proximity, to do, to do with witness and to do with touching, um, is to uh, kind of propose a counter figure in the figure of St. Thomas. And there was a very strong cult of St. Thomas uh, within communal um, and Republican um, Italy and the northern city states. And here we can see the very famous statue by Verrocchio that's in the Or San Michele uh, in the center of Florence, a uh, beautiful piece of uh, sculptural work where, with Thomas raising his hand uh, to the wound of the uh, risen uh, Christ by way of witness. So, I mean, Verrocchio here and the figure of St. Thomas is fundamentally concerned, and St. Thomas was the patron saint of judges. So Thomas's sole sin, if you like, was not to be not to have been present when the risen Christ uh, was um, appearing to the disciples. Um, but I think he, this notion of, of, of doubt, which fundamentally attaches itself um, to Thomas and the notion of interrogation is really, really interesting in this respect in juxtaposing Thomas to the figure um, of, um, of, of Judas. Because whereas Judas touches, uh, in the act of betrayal. Uh, the reality is, and this is a kind of a, a misrecognition, because here we have, here we have the, the Caravaggio uh, depiction of, of, of doubting Thomas, which is very carnal. I mean, it, we can see that Thomas has actually got his finger kind of inserted in the wound. But if we actually read the section in, in the, the Gospel according to St. John, the reality is that Thomas 
doesn't actually touch. He doesn't actually put his finger in. He's invited by the risen Christ uh, to put his finger in uh, and to actually feel the incarnation of a reincarnated uh, saviour. But actually he stops and he says, um, he doesn't put his hand into the side, he says, um, my Lord, my God, which is actually the beginning, the origins of the credo. Um, so that the part of the lit legitimacy, the, the part of the liturgy, which is fundamentally concerned with the, the statement, the statement of faith. So here we have uh, a very different transaction, if you like, a, a kind of a transaction which is predicated on, on, on trust, um, a, a characterization uh, which is based on the seeking after proof, but fundamentally uh, belief. And we have the, the rejoinder uh, that comes to Thomas when Jesus says, because you have seen me, uh, you have found faith. Happy are they who never saw me and yet have found faith. So for me, the figure of, of, of Thomas is, is far more kind of uh, suggestive of the, the position of the, the average person in the, in the everyday. And I think when we talk about public spaces and we talk about social distancing and we talk about contact tracing, um, we're aware that the piazzas and the streets of the communities within which we live, and especially within Italy, are always places of coming together. And the, the impulse to do that, I felt, was incredibly well uh, evidenced by um, in the early days of the pandemic in Italy, when people actually came out onto their balconies. They weren't allowed to come down into the street. They weren't allowed to come down in the piazza to kind of aggregate uh, and draw, draw together a sense of community. And again, in the UK, we've had the Thursday clapping uh, for the NHS. But there is this impulse, despite the restrictions, to actually come together to, to celebrate difference um and to to show solidarity with each other and i've put on the left hand side one of those utopian idealized cityscapes um, that were very popular in renaissance but we can see that there's nobody in them they are empty the reality uh, of the street the reality of the piazza um, is a place of coming together and we can see here an image on the right from the g8 um uh protests uh, that were held in uh, in genoa um back in the day um, and I think it's, it's, there's an irony within the fact in terms of identifying community that it's, it's within the empty spaces, actually, of the piazza. It's the empty heart of the city that people coming together actually generate meaning, whether that meaning is to confirm social order, to confirm social norms, or whether it's to resist and to protest them. But that notion of being able to scendere in piazza, to go down into the streets, uh, to vocalize, to protest, to articulate, to challenge um, orders, to challenge uh, practices, uh, as well as to confirm them, I think puts that, puts space and its use very much at the center of, uh, of the idea of generating community. And I think one of the challenges of what's been happening in the recent past is the absence, the emptying of streets, the emptying of piazzas and what has been the surrogate, what has taken the place in a sense of generating uh, that connectedness. And I'd like to think that one of the things that's done that has, has, has been literature, it has been culture, it has been reading, um, it has been um, uh, people uh, sharing experiences, being in touch with each other through social media, through a public sphere, which is actually digitally mediated. And the, the very experience that we're having now is the perfect testimony to in some ways plugging that gap or seeking some kind of compensatory uh, means of remaining in touch with each other and generating uh, a, a kind of strangely alienated uh, but actual uh, community uh, of connectivity between ourselves. Now I want to finish up by just moving on to a, another research project which I've been doing which is also in some ways about touch, it's about connectivity but it's also about texts um, and it's also about contagion and, and, and it's also about bacteria. Um, and it fundamentally does, does uh, revolve around, around books. Uh, and recently I've been working with a fantastic uh, group of researchers um, on uh, sampling uh, parchment. And we come back then to this issue about the relationship between animals on the one hand and humans on the other, between transmission and the idea of knowledge as being something which is contagious, is epidemiology uh, of representations uh, through the mediation uh, of knowledge transfer. And what we've been doing with this particular project, and it's been led by Matthew Collins in, in Cambridge, um, together with uh, Sarah Fidiman, uh, is actually, again, it comes back to contact. We've been rubbing 
the animal skins that were used for the making of parchment um, for the production of text in order to actually identify the species uh, of the animal. Now, the technology for this is, is incredible uh, and it's very complex, uh, but it fundamentally involves um, uh, chains of amino acids, it involves uh, generation of trypsin, uh, it then gets put into uh, what's called a maldi tofs mass spectrometer, uh, which is TOF for time of flight, uh, and then the, the, the samples are shot through um, a vacuum um, in this max spectrometer and the time of flight actually tells us what the animal is uh, for the manuscript uh, or the text itself uh, and this is then mapped onto a, a database which allows the species identification. Um, since uh, and, th and then we can begin looking at kind of graphic distributions of where different types of texts come, what kind of substrates they've been produced and it, it brings together if you like the, the animal uh, with the actual uh, body of the text, the two different corpora. We come back to this issue of bodies. There's a textual corpus, but the literal corpus uh, of the animal itself. And since we've been doing this, the technology has just become incredible. We started off looking at proteins and looking at species identification. It then moved very quickly on in terms of the diagnostic possibility of this technology of using the Stedler rubber to identify DNA, and even more recently to actually starting to look at metagenomics to actually look at the bacteria that lies on texts um, as we can see kind of mapped here so one of the things that was was done in this field of metagenomics um, uh, which Matthew and the team um, uh, who used to be in York but now now at Cambridge did was to test the York gospel from about the year 1000 uh, to see what microbes, what bacteria was actually held uh, on a page of that text? And to me, as a humanist who's not used to uh, reading scientific data, uh, we have this amazing color chart on the left-hand side of the screen. Um, but what I find most uh, stunning in terms of the breakdown of the bacterial types that we have on the color chart on the right-hand side is at the bottom in brackets, it says 1,158 not shown. So the sheer richness of the bacterial register that science is now enabling us forensically to extract from texts really does ask us how cultured, in that sense, um, some of the texts that we have in foreclosing um, the difference between the animal kingdom uh, and knowledge transfer uh, and, and the human world. And that reply applies also to skin. We ourselves are huge carriers of uh, 100 trillion uh, microbes, which outnumber ourselves by uh, a multiple of 10. The richness, in a sense, of the pathogenic bacteria that we carry uh, just within our own skins and that we're finding and investigating in terms of the skins that carry our knowledge as texts uh, when cultured. Uh, is, is absolutely immense and the potential of this is enormous and in some ways it's this kind of interdisciplinary research I think which is helping us to try and close the gap um, on the old hackneyed um, two cultures uh, debate um, and I think humanities scholars that have been concerned with bodies are very often within the Renaissance paradigm been concerned with um, bodies in terms of the building of literary corpora but I think this kind of research is fascinating because it helps us close the gap between literary corpora and actual corpora. And I think this quote from Kagan's The Three Cultures, the evidential base for the humanities is written texts and other records of human behavior. For the natural sciences, it is experimentally controlled observations of material entities. But I think my question is, what does it mean for the history of the book, for example, when these two come together, when we move from intellectual genealogies to biological genealogies and we actually lay them over the top of each other in terms of their textual um, uh, uh, intertextual relations. So the kind of the, the biologically uh, annotated book. And when we try and visualize these genealogies of knowledge uh, and we try and we, we, we map uh, DNA. It's amazing how they look like the kind of stem of, of manuscript studies of, 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 of classical and romance um, philology. The way in which we imagine them uh, is incredibly similar. And also the metaphors that we've used in terms of the book of nature, the nature of the book, um, leaves, folios, stem, branches of knowledge, the codex comes from the Latin for 
for log, we talk about spines, headings, footnotes, etc. The, 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 the sense of the body of literature uh, is, is absolutely synonymous and almost it's a homologous uh, with, uh, with, with the body of, 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 of the self, of, of the animal, um, out of which the, uh, the material out of which books are actually made. And the key thing for me, and this comes back to the difference between the kind of betrayal narrative of a, of a Judas as a social actor within a community and the kind of more uh, doubting but inquiring form of uh, investigation typified by Thomas is that in terms of research, I think it is about being in networks. It is about forming communities. It is about connection uh, and it is about kind of collaboration, the bringing together of competencies. And that's the, the one thing that I think in terms of my own research, I, the, the contagion, if you like, um, that, 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 that I've suffered in inverted commas, uh, in working with other people from different disciplines has knocked me out of shape. It's redefined the body uh, of my work and taken it to places uh, that I otherwise wouldn't have gone. Um, so, so to conclude uh, in some shape or form uh, from where we started out, I think it's really some things that have come out or made me think uh, in terms of what things might look like on the other side. What is it that we need to think about uh, moving forward? is the extent to which these discussions about social cohesion, uh, social conflict, about ways in which we come together, ways in which when we're separated, we seek to come back together. And what does it, what, what is the place of culture in terms of generating a community? Uh, and what is the benefit of that coming together? Um, it goes right the way down. I've given you two classic texts that stand very, very apart in terms of their particular approaches to narratives of evolution. Um, we've got on the one hand, Richard Dawkins, this sort of social Darwinism of what he calls the selfish gene. And on the other hand, the, 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 the work of Lynn Margulis, for example, uh, and the kind of more what are called Gaia theories about the notion of a, a symbiotic planet, that actually we, we don't evolve necessarily, or do we, this is the debate, in, in terms of competition with each other, uh, in terms of the, the pursuit of our own self-interest, in terms of the insistent upon the literal nature of contract, in terms of the, the hardening of positions through kind of solidarity. But actually we're refashioned in our coming together and our meeting with other people and our encounter with different subjects, with different methodologies, with different practices, with different races, with different groups. Uh, there's a, a kind of an enriching um, through that notion of giving something up, that actually we profit or we benefit. And this is Lynn Margulis's point at the level of the, of the cell itself, that it is in the process of coming into contact that things evolve, that they actually give something up, they reformulate, but it's a collaborative enterprise. It's about an adaptability, not about a competition. It's about being soft and it's about listening. It's about giving something up. And that's the way um, that can lead to a kind of an enrichment, a, a, a tolerance um, and a more empathetic, in many ways, uh, attitude towards the other and also towards our own environment, uh, as we've seen nature uh, regenerate itself um, so strongly uh, during the course of the shutdown. So I'll, I'll leave it there. They are thoughts, in a sense, that are mediated through the research that I've been doing on various subjects. I've tried to kind of pull them together um, through the, uh, the, 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 the prism of what we're currently living through uh, and just make some suggestions uh, about ways forward. So thank you very much for listening and I'm uh, happy to take uh, questions. Yeah, so I don't know whether you can see me. Stephen, if you shut your share screen. Okay, I can see you. Yeah, <laughs> brilliant. Yeah. So thank you so much, Stephen, um, for a wonderful paper and for sort of connecting the historical with the contemporary. Um, questions are actually coming through as you spoke. So I'll put you out of your misery. The inf what Roger Gill wrote in to say that inflating animals was a quick way of skinning them. I wonder whether that was it, where you're actually putting the, you're, you're putting the uh, bellows between the kind of skin, the outer skin and the inner yeah. to able you to, to strip them out. Yeah, so thank okay. you very much, Roger. Um, and so that's very helpful. Uh, 
we now have, yes, we've got a question about community from Susanna. Um, and she says, I wonder if you found evidence of how communities <clears throat> in Italy in the past dealt with gatherings in church. In the UK, all places of worship have been shut to congregations for communal worship. And what was the equivalent response during previous pandemics? I haven't, in terms of uh, proclamations and looking at uh, 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 the documents that I've been show showed at the beginning of the paper, I haven't heard of any, there aren't there written any instances of um, the banning of uh, people actually coming to church, of congregations, uh, or, or even of, of public preaching. Um, none of those are specifically mentioned uh, in any of the proclamations themselves. I mean, there was a the tradition always was to have that curtain. There's the, the famous picture of the, um, the campo in, in Siena when Bernardino de Siena is preaching with the curtain down the middle with the women on one side and the men on the other side. Um, but I, I haven't come across any evidence in the, the material that I was citing that actually closed down or suspended um, uh, religious celebrations or the, the hearing of the mass um, during times of, of, of the plague. Yeah, I know, thank you. Um, so we, we have a, yeah, so there's, <laughs> people are responding to different parts of your presentation. So from the final part of your presentation, yep. Maria says, how can the information drawn from the parchment be put in relation to its content? And it seems to me that an entire new world is opening up side by side with phil phil philology. Well, it's a kind of biological form of, of philology. I mean, I guess the, the ultimate fantasy for the scientists and the philologists would be to be able to map the transmission of knowledge through the genealogy of the animals that are carrying it. So t textual relations would be literal relations, uh, if you like. Um, now, it's going to take quite a long time to build up that quantity of data set, um, but it's... I mean, I think what's revolutionary about it as a technology, as a, as a technique, um, if it can be upscaled and in a sense, the upscaling is getting more possible because the unit cost and the, 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 the volume of, of samples that can be processed at any one time is going up as the unit cost is going down. Um, I think the, the, what's revolutionary about it, for, certainly for archeologists, is that where previously they were looking for an object that they dug or a bone, the realization that, uh, that that actually archives contain these huge faunal records. I mean, they that the people, the scientists aren't necessarily interested in what's written on them. They're interested in the fact that they can derive this faunal data. And there is archives constantly. There are over thirty million parchment records in the Norfolk Records Office alone. Mm -hmm. So it's a it's a huge faunal untapped or in, beginning to be tapped uh, resource that can uh, that allows us to. To, to open up now the question of how that relates to actually what's written on the text I think is really interesting because my experience of working with the scientists on this to date has been that very often they'll develop the technology and the technique to derive the scientific data that they require but what they want off the humanists in a sense is a story off which to hang the technique mm. um, and the, the particular one that well there were two studies that we did one on uterine vellum and the production of Paris Bibles um, and the other one was on um, parchment aldines and the, the change in the substrate on the death of Aldous Minutius uh, when he died uh, and his work his workshop then switched from goat uh, to to calf uh, and trying to explain you know, we would we would not have realized that that had taken place if we hadn't actually done the scientific testing okay. on the on the parchment aldines so it is opening up a really interesting area in kind of bio bibliography um, and in a sense, you know, where paper has always had the benefits of the history of paper and its manufacture and production through the study of watermarks, I think this kind of new scientific technology allows us the equivalent of watermarks, um, but for animal skins themselves. Hmm. No, really interesting. So we're now getting, we've got sort of two sets of questions. Um, one kind of relating to Boccaccio and Machiavelli. So, um, Vivian asks, are there other writers between Boccaccio and Machiavelli who, in, espo, espo, uh, I can't say, who set their narratives in specific plague setting? Uh, ooh. Um, off the top of my head, I, I mean, uh, post, post Boccaccio in the Italian tradition and before Manzoni, um, I'd have to get back to you on that one, Vivian. Um, I, not not of that fame, let's say, uh, that's for sure. 
but uh, I'd, I'd have to have to think about that one because I, I can't think of. I mean, other people listening might have suggestions, but off the top of my head, I can't think of anybody. Uh, mm. and certainly not within the the kind of late medieval Renaissance Italian context, um, mm. who predicates their work specifically within the framing context mm. um, of a plague narrative. No, interesting. Um, so Jennifer says wonderful thank you um and she says that she's been rereading so she'll be one of the uh however thousand people who went and read the decameron um and i was struck by the fact of the brigata fleeing to their second home in the country and how unethical this now seems given recent rules during lockdown should we be and or is boccaccio criticizing the brigata for this behavior bella domanda that's a really that's a really good question because that, uh, to be honest, when I was rereading the introduction and I was thinking through, I took a more sort of sententious stance in terms of the, um, the, 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 the Cameron, because you're right, it is, they, they have the opportunity, they have the privilege, uh, they have the ability to leave the town, they have another place to go in the country. And I mean, that's a, it's a brilliant point, because that's exactly the issue that came up in the UK, is that people, there was a whole debate about what is the position in terms of people leaving to go to their second homes? Uh, and what was the resentment of the communities within those areas of Cornwall, uh, or in those areas of Pembrokeshire, who were particularly hit? with people leaving, lar leaving larger cities in order to take up, because they thought they'd be more secure uh, in the country. Um, I think that's an incredibly uh, valid question. Um, and the other thing that struck me is that everybody knows the names of the, the 10 members of the Brigata, but actually it's only on rereading the introduction that you realize that a lot of the servants have got names and yet they're just not represented. So, um, you know, there are other lives uh, within the corniture and the frame of the Decameron who do not have voice and there's a there's a marvelous piece by David Wallace um, about um, uh, about Boccaccio and the slave trade, uh, which you know I must go in the current climate and, and reread. But the way in which Boccaccio kind of completely overlooks and doesn't even make a make mention of social realities and practices that he must have walked past and been encountering on a on a regular basis in relation to uh, the traffic and the practices of slavery uh, within late medieval Italian ports. So I, I think these kind of questions are, are if anything, the, the contemporary issues that we're confronting and the, the realities of the choices that people are having to make or being requested to make or are making, but other people's aren't. And you know, I'm not pointing the finger at anybody in particular, but I think that debate was really interesting uh, in terms of, you know, the emotion that it unleashed and the stories that came to light of people who'd denied themselves the ability to go and see a loved one who was dying or had made those sacrifices uh, and again it comes back to my kind of complete concluding comments that in many ways these situations this the, the kind of the, the stress and the trauma of this pandemic has actually been really revealing i think it's a they're they're a great kind of diagnostic tool in terms of an understanding of human behavior uh and you know people show their colours, I think, in terms of the way in which they confront these issues. Mm. So what would, yeah, no, I think, yeah, no, you're right. Um, uh, what we're getting is fantastic. We're getting um, listeners interacting with each other's comments. So <laughs> following on from Jennifer's question, Kenneth Clark says, I too, Hi there, Kenneth. <laughs> I too have been reading the Proemio and I was struck by Barcaccio's alignment of lockdown as a problem for ladies who are lovesick. And yeah themselves of these feelings how does love sickness and the plague intersect oh that's a fantastic question um well in the sense that you know there's the whole remedia amoris tradition that comes through from ovid with the notion that love in itself is a sickness so i mean i think the, the there's a kind of deliberate overlay uh, there but you're right the the claustrophilia book that i showed you the cover of uh, is kind of relevant to boccaccio in as much as as, as kenneth quite rightly says that the, the book is addressed to uh, loved lawn ladies who are sort of shut up in their closets uh, and not able to kind of express their, their, their desires uh, and our rather kind of uh, lewd narrator uh, is effectively, you know, it's, it's that medieval tradition of the, um, uh, the kind of text as a go-between, um, the, the text as kind of into the... the, the um, Literatura mezzana, I think, is Bruno's term for it. So lit literature is a means of, again, as I, I said earlier on, um, an expression of desire, uh, culture, 
um, being this kind of go, having this go between function or mediating function. Um, and I, I, I think love and the plague are very similar in terms of the way in which they talk about infection, the way they talk about contagion. And our narrator of the Decameron actually confesses in the Proemio and the beginning of the introduction of the text that he himself has been infected, that he himself has been uh, disturbed or um, upset, literally, in terms of there being a rebalancing of, of within faculty psychology of his humours. But that actually it was through the consolation and the coming together in the community with his friends that in a kind of cathartic way uh, enabled him to get back in control of himself and overcome the the, the unreciprocated uh, love of the uh, the lady with whom he was enamored. So the, the, the notion of love as an illness um, and love as something which is potentially contagious, uh, but which requires the community of friends and readers um, as, a, uh, as a means of healing uh, is very much running, running through the text. I'm not sure if that answers specifically uh, Ken's point, but I'm more than happy to talk to him about it uh, <laughs> later. Um. Right. Well, I can see. I think we've got the time for a little. You've got still got some energy. So he, um, Kenneth, also says there's a wonderful gloss in the BL copy of the history of the uh, uh, Longobards in the hands of Boccaccio on how the plague in Florence and throughout the whole world. But you can you can involve in that. So we've got okay. two questions about values and then um, one observation. And I think um, you would have earned your uh, supper. So. Um, uh, Florique says, as a Dutch historian living permanently in Rome, I have been struck in particular during the past months by the very strong sense of solidarity in Italy. The notion that it is self-evident that younger generations should protect the older ones and more vulnerable ones. That notion of solidarity itself seems to be different in Northern Europe. Do you recognise this and do you see this in 15th and 16th centuries too? Yeah, solidarity is an interesting word. I mean, I, I kind of used it in my last slide and I gave it a bit of a kind of, a, I put it on the negative side of those, those simplistic binaries um, in the sense of, you know, solidarity is coming from the Latin solidus. I mean, you know, just not being, solidarity, which is the, the consolidation of a, a position that doesn't leave itself kind of open to negotiation, is less porous, let's say. Um, but I mean, I, I do think solidarity in the normal kind of semantic range in which the word is, is used does have that sense of kind of coming together and of mutual support. Um, and I think, I, think, I, think there's a, I think there's a recognition of precarity. I mean, I think it comes back to this, this, this notion of people's, and I guess what, what people like Petrarch and the Stoics were talking about, about the, the complete randomness of fortune this was something that nobody well m people kind of could predict or could model but the speed with which it happened um and how much control do we have over our destinies when these global effect global um phenomenon kind of strike us so i think it does build into a a, a narrative of precarity of precariousness um of the as, as it would have been described in the medieval period more in terms of you know discourses on on on, on the, the caprice a fortune in lives and how to overcome it and obviously stoicism in part is a philosophy which is there to kind of mediate or mitigate the the, the threat of adverse fortune um but i do think it, it, it's something which makes us recognize the vulnerability of others and you know i, I don't know if my dad's watching but you know he's there self-isolating up in nottinghamshire on his own at 93 years of age and, you know, one would like to get back and be there and support. But in many ways, that would be precisely the wrong thing to do uh, on medical grounds and what have you. So I think one of the one of the outturns of the of this particular pandemic and crisis, hopefully, is a kind of recognition of the vulnerability of, of other groups uh, and ways in which it, it's reminded people of the importance of knowing who your neighbor is what their needs are how you can help them and how what yeah the needs of strangers yeah um and how that how they can need to be taken into consideration so yeah there's a dark side to it but i think there's always the upside um which is that it probably has bound communities let's hope that's not lost let's hope people yeah. remember that that's something that has to be kind of reiterated through renewed or different rituals and practices of care um, and that would be that would be a good thing um, if it comes out, and it would be a good thing if it questions power in different ways, uh, and if the values um, of, of 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 kind of competition and contrast uh, are are softened um, mm. as we move forward. 
So <laughs> I'm gonna, um, uh, yeah, we've got what, two questions which kind of ask this, similar things. We are now seeing in the UK the release of the lockdown as an urgent response to pressing economic concerns. Is there any uh, sense of such anxieties and dilemmas of managing competing risks in the archives of Florence? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. there's, a, there's a, a, a history of Renaissance risk assessment. Yeah. <laughs> um, there's a book to be written. Mm. I don't know. I mean, I think I think what the great tension that within Florentine historiography uh, that I'm aware of, having kind of grown up with it through the works of, of people like Weissman and Trexler, it, it really is. And I think it runs again through through Boccaccio and other writers and, you know, right the way through to Machiavelli as well, to some extent. It is this tension between sacrifice and contract, mm. between, between you know, a financial transaction for the exchange of money uh, for the, in the pursuit of profit on the one hand, and the notion of giving something up for free, um, and, and if that is possible. Is, is there such a thing as a free gift? So a, a lot of the work that's been done on neighbourhoods, that's been done on family groupings, um, that have been done on parishes and streets and a lot of the work that's been done in Florence on communities really tries to drive into these these questions I think in terms of analyzing um, the ways in which people aggregate the their interrelation um, and I think in a part that's where Weissman's notion of the importance of being ambiguous comes from because he uses this wonderfully suggestive and I, I, I'm not really reconciled to it as a concept but he uses this notion of, and this is why I said three degrees of separation. It mm. wasn't it wasn't a homage to Motown. It was it was because the 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 notion was in a in a very closely knit face to face society uh, like Florence, where everybody knew everybody and was not that far away from being related to them in some shape or form. Uh, that actually, what Weissman characterised, he says, there was an excess of community. Mm. Uh, and I think I'm, I'm really interested in that notion of their, the possibility that there could be within certain groups or societies an excess of an excess of community. And maybe, you know, in, in the discourses of modernity, that the figure of the flaneur as a kind of voyeur is, is actually about their anonymity. They're, they're, they're there as kind of anonymous observers who are somehow not caught up in the kind of fast-paced, routinized, uh, consumerist race of modernity, but standing aside and kind of watching it um, mm. from, a, from, a, from a kind of critical distance. But yeah, uh, it'd be interesting to think around what would constitute a history of Renaissance risk management. Good question. Well. <laughs> The next uh, call for BSR BSL fellowships. Um, I think uh, you have <laughs> um, earned a virtual round of applause. Thank you so much, Stephen. Um, and I look forward to seeing you in Rome. I should say to all our listeners, thank you so much for tuning in um, on a beautiful sunny day. Uh, we have our last in this series um, will be Julia Hilner, who is a member of our faculty, but she's also um, uh, at the University of Sheffield. So please do tune in for the same time next week for, for Julia's talk. And thank you for your support. And thank you to Stephen um, for your lecture. Thank you. You're more than welcome. Buonasera a tutti. Yeah. Goodbye, everybody. It's a bit brutal when we cut off, but thank you very, very much for listening. Ciao, ciao.